Since the earliest incarnation of the present castle, a simple Mott and Bailey construction, its walls have seen an abundance of life coming and going. The chronicle of Richard, prior of Hexham, refers in 1138 to a munitissimum castellum, a most heavily fortified castle at Annick, perhaps suggesting that the wooden structure had been replaced in stone by that date. The present owners, the Percy family, purchased the castle and barony of Annick in 1309, and it is thought that the constable's tower was constructed by command of the first Lord Percy of Annick, who died in 1314, or else his son. The tower stands today relatively unaltered since its creation in the early 14th century, yet what changes it has witnessed over those seven centuries, both within and without its walls. If only these walls could speak. Originally, the tower was constructed for military reasons, John Goodall, architectural editor of Country Life and author of The English Castle 1066-1650, is here to tell us more about its features. You are standing on the middle floor of this three-storey tower. The room served as a lodging for a senior figure in the Percy family household. It's rectangular in plan, but the exterior of the tower is in fact rounded towards the front, where it projects forward from the castle wall. The windows to the sides of the room open out as narrow slits that look along the line of the wall and could have been used as firing positions for crossbows. In time of war, castles had to be prepared for action rather in the manner of battleships. Hinged shutters, for example, could be taken out of storage and hung between battlements to protect the castle garrison from missiles. Over time, Annick Castle has witnessed many dramatic episodes of national significance. Just across the river from the castle, Malcolm Canmore, King of the Scots, was ambushed and killed by the Earl of Northumbria in 1093. During the Wars of the Roses, the castle was twice surrendered to the Lancastrian Queen, Margaret of Anjou, and her husband, Henry VI, in 1461 and 1462. Border warfare with Scotland, meanwhile, remained a perennial problem. Annick Town was burnt by the Scots in 1420 and again in 1448. Violence and theft remained a fact of border life into the 17th century. Annick was still being used during the Civil War when 140 Cromwellian troops were quartered here. A contemporary account by Robert Watson, one of the 10th Earl's officers at the castle, reports on the damage caused by troops of both parties. One of the items in the display case behind me is a breastplate from this period, pierced by a bullet, possibly left behind by one of these soldiers. The same eyewitness, Robert Watson, describes how 6,000 Scots, taken prisoner by Cromwell after the Battle of Dunbar in 1650, were lodged overnight at Annick Castle, betwixt the middle and upper gate, on their route march from Dunbar to Durham. From Annick, they were marched on to Morpeth, where they were held in a walled garden. Half starving, they ate raw cabbages, roots and leaves which poisoned them. Only 3,000 eventually arrived in Durham to be incarcerated within the cathedral, apparently burning the furniture for warmth. A further 1,600 died there of the flux. After the Civil War, the tower lay unused for more than a century until 1798, when the perceived threat of French invasion reinvigorated its military use, this time as an armoury for the Percy Tenantry Volunteers. This force of just over one and a half thousand riflemen, cavalry and artillery raised from the tenants of the Duke's estates across Northumberland formed part of a network of home defence units across the country. Here is Bill Openshaw, a knowledgeable military enthusiast, to tell us more. From a store's return compiled in 1808, we were able to get a picture of some of what was actually kept in the rooms of the Constable's Tower. The store's return and other documents give us a hint of some of the uses of the armourer's bench which can be seen in the case behind me. One of the probable jobs undertaken on this bench was the manufacture of rifle cartridges. The first step would be to melt lead before using this ladle to pour the molten lead into a bullet mould. This though was not the finished ball. The rifle had a groove on the inside of the barrel that caused the ball to spin upon firing. This resulted in the ball going straighter and further. However, the ball had to be tight within the barrel. Normally a leather or cloth patch would be wrapped around the ball. 
The ball was then used to make a cartridge. After applying a small amount of glue along the edge of the wax cartridge paper, a wooden dowel of the correct diameter and a ball would be placed on it before rolling up into a tube. The ball end would then be secured by twisting and tying with thread. The tube now would be filled with a measured amount of gunpowder before the top of the cartridge was folded and tied to secure it. Several cartridges would then be wrapped together in a pack to issue to the men. As the military threat died down, the equipment of the Percy Tenantry volunteers was laid up to rest and stored here in the tower. Over time, the Percy family added other items, either collected on their travels abroad or received from friends and acquaintances around the world. Dr Les Jessup will tell us about some of the more unexpected items on display and how they came to be here. Most of these relics were probably brought from North America during the late 1780s by the Second Duke. He was in the British Army during the American War of Independence, where he became friendly with the Mohawk leader Joseph Brunt. It is tempting to think that this stone pipe was a gift from the Mohawk leader to his friend. Like many tourists, the Second Duke brought souvenirs home, like these boxes made from birch bark and decorated with embroidery. But not many tourists would have their boxes decorated with the family crest. These Sudanese relics call to mind British involvement in Africa a century ago. The Duke probably got these two shields and Jebel Katala in the Nuba Mountains. They are a very rare type. None of the big museums in Britain has anything like them. These Polynesian items have a link to John Williams, a very important missionary who was killed in the South Seas in 1839. Before leaving Britain for the last time, he toured the country raising money. The Third Duke and Duchess of Northumberland were very generous donors, and they were made life members of the Missionary Society. So the tower became an intriguing part of any visit to the castle. Generations of tourists have enjoyed visiting it, just as you are today. One of the most entertaining accounts is that of William Howitt in 1842. One of the finest or most characteristic things about the place is the old porter, a tall, fine-looking old man in drab, who, though he must have shown the exterior of the castle a thousand times, still continues to show it with unabated unction. It is quite a treat to meet with such a man. He shows you with much interest the skeletons of two jackdaws which were found in one of the towers, and which he imagines to have lived and died together in the greatest state of affection, lying cuddled together as they died, he presumes, of old age, because they were in a tower where they could not have perished from confinement or want. Besides the skins of enormous snakes, he also shows a variety of arms, dresses and a canoe of the Eskimo. He displays to you with much formality the manner in which they use their paddle, and how they right themselves when upset at sea, twirling the paddle about in a very extraordinary manner, and which requires you to keep pretty well out of its way. Daniel Watkins, our head guide, could be seen as the present-day successor of the porter. There are parallels between my post as head guide and the porter of the 19th century. I like to think that my team and I welcome visitors to the castle today with equal enthusiasm. I share stories with visitors from all around the world, such as the one about the hobby horse bicycles in the case behind me, which was originally told to William Howitt by the porter in 1842. It is said that the Duke and his physician used to amuse themselves with careering on these steeds about the grounds, but one day, being somewhere on the terrace, his grace's Trojan steed capsized and rolled over and over with him down the green bank, much to the amusement of a troop of urchins who were mounted on a wall by the road to witness this novel kind of racing. On this accident, the bicycle was laid up in lavender, and a fine specimen of the breed it is. How it asked if the story was true, but the old porter only smiled and said, Mind, I did not tell you that. Don't pretend to say, if you write any account of this place, that you had that from me. That's very good advice. I'll remember that. But perhaps the tower was most alive when somebody actually lived in it. We believe this room was occupied by one of the castle's principal office holders, the constable, so giving the tower the name that has stuck. 
John de Felton is the first known constable in 1314. The earliest reference to the name of Constable's Tower, however, comes in 1567 in George Clarkson's survey of the castle. This is the actual 450-year-old document bound in the 19th century to preserve it. From this, we gain a very detailed description of domestic life in the castle. The said Constable's Tower is three parts round, the fourth square, and is of three house height. The nether part serveth for a buttery, the other two parts serveth for two fair lodgings, and it is covered with lead. And betwixt the said Constable's Tower and the Poston Tower standeth one fair brew house, well covered with slate, wherein there is a copper set in a furnace oaked with a crib of clapboard, which will hold liquor for the brewing of twenty-three bowls of malt. And joining upon the said Poston Tower standeth the bakehouse, well covered with slate. In the north end thereof there be two ovens, and joining to the said bakehouse is builded two houses of two house height. The nether part thereof serveth for a slaughterhouse and storehouse, the other for hay and chambers for the launderers. Here's John Goodall again to comment on the constable's tower as a dwelling place. This room functioned as an independent apartment comprising a bedroom come living room with a fireplace and opening off it a latrine in the depth of the wall. The windows may have been glazed but were also sealed with shutters. In winter rushes would have been strewn across the floor for warmth. A bed with a canopy of curtains to keep out draughts would have been the principal piece of furniture. There would have been fabric hangings on the walls and also cushions. The materials used, whether wool or some richer fabric, would have depended on the wealth of the occupant. There might also have been wooden furnishings, such as stools or chairs. The overall effect would have been simple but comfortable. If you look into the corner over to your left, behind the glass case, you'll see an alcove. This small side chamber, containing the latrine, is built within the depth of the tower wall. The bench sat above a chute that projected out beyond the line of the wall, throwing the waste into the castle ditch. A wooden lid could be placed over the opening to close off the draught and keep out the smell. In modern accounts of castles, such latrines are usually termed guard robes, but they were referred to by many different slang names in the medieval period. The first Duchess in the 1750s was not keen on the suggestion of excrement down the walls of her fairy tale Gothic castle, and so all external trace of the garderobe appears to have been removed. At the same time, the creation of an idyllic landscape setting for the castle led to the alteration of the ground level in the inner bailey, effectively blocking up the tower's ground floor. If you've noticed the slope at the bottom of the tower changing as we span through the years, now you know why. However, we know from an account of 1785 that the interior of the rest of the tower remained intact as a specimen to show how the castle in general was anciently fitted up. The same account mentions that the tower changed its name at this period to the Cock Tower when a distinctive weather vane was added. And there's a good story behind that too. Robin Smeaton, our Clerk of Works, can tell us more. By 2011, the tower was in much need of repair to restore the lead roof and eroded masonry, so we took down the weather vane for safekeeping whilst the work was underway. When we looked closely at it, we discovered various inscriptions by previous clerks of works. Following tradition, I added my name together with those of the workmen on this project. The most intriguing discovery was that it was full of bullet holes. To our surprise, a rather confessional duke owned up to using it for target practice along with his two brothers during their formative years. Fired up by the spirit of the old Percy volunteers, perhaps. We hope you've enjoyed stopping a while to hear what stories these walls have to share with us. And as you leave Constable's Tower today, out along the curtain wall, be sure to look back and spot those bullet holes in the weather vane.